Hey, Graham, how are you going, mate? I'm good, how are you? Have you been having a, a good conference so far? Uh, I'm having an absolute ball, mate. And look, I cannot believe all these people have chosen us over Troy Holm. Ah, uh, yeah. This is just like I heard, I heard they had beer, so they might have chosen the wrong session. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, you don't need beers at our session. It's going to be awesome. Hey, I, I've, I've been um, I've been thinking about doing a new startup. Okay. And, and, and bear with me, right? So my idea is I'm going to do machine learning and serverless blockchain for yep. refrigerated ice dispersal. So, oh, dude. But I'm going to call it... Internet of Things as well. No, 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 no. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to call it the ice cream van bot. The ice cream van yeah. bot. Can I, I've been writing some code that I really um, quite excited about. Yep. And, and I really respect your opinion. I was wondering if I could show it to you and get some feedback. Is that okay? Uh, look, yeah, I'd love to. I actually, I really like looking at other people's code. I find it's a really good way to sort of learn new techniques, new things. So, uh, yeah, bring it up. That's yeah, well, so I've been writing some unit tests. Unit tests are awesome, man. <laughs> right? Uh, they're brilliant, yeah. I love yeah. unit tests, TDD, all those kind of techniques really help me write code. Yep. Nice. So this is the this is one of the tests that I've been writing. I'm just wondering okay. what you think, mate. All right, cool. Well, let's let's have a look. So um, uh, just give me a second. I'll just scan through. Okay, so so you okay if I give you a bit of kind of feedback on what I'm seeing here? Yeah, Some yeah. Some comments and stuff. Absolutely. So I really like the way you're using uh, a range, act, and assert to lay out this code. Like, I think that's a really really nice technique because it makes it really obvious when I'm looking at it where you're setting up your state what it is that you're actually trying to do in your act part, and then I can see what you're expecting to happen in the assert. So yeah. really like that. I always use AAA, it's awesome. AAA man. is cool, yeah, it's really, really good. Um, so, yeah, okay, are you okay if I give you some kind of comments where I think, you know, we could maybe change things, make yeah, it Yeah, I'd love better? some feedback, that'd be great. All right, cool, so let's have a quick look through. So we can see here, we've got mock ice cream price calculator, top, top returns, for the, okay, customer provider find by name, Customer's got a balance. There's an ice ice cream van. So you're writing software for an ice cream van, right? Yeah, the ice cream van bot. <laughs> it's coming into the right time of year, so that's cool. It's kind of nice and warm out there in Sydney. Um, it's going to be warmer in Perth, I think, this weekend, and probably a good time to buy ice cream. So we're going to try and sell Graham a chalk top. Yep. So that's pretty cool. And then we're going to check the customer at the end. We're going to check they've received their type of chalk top, and we're going to check their balance. All right. So. Um, there's a lot of mock objects in here, right? You, you like mock objects? I love mock objects. I use them for everything. It's awesome, man. Re really? Okay, right, right. Um, so are you okay if I share a few kind of war stories I've had with mock objects? Yeah, that'd be great. I'd years? love to hear it. Because, you know, I, I used to use them a lot as well, but I find that I don't use them nearly as often as I used okay. to. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to take you back like six or seven years. I was working on a system uh, in Perth, actually writing a second-hand uh, trading system. And we had a lot of code like this scattered for our application. So all our tests had this kind of same arrange act assert with the mock objects. Do you have this code copied in a lot of places as well? Yeah, I've probably got about 30 tests that look reasonably similar with some of the different variations. Yeah, yeah right, okay, yeah. So we were a very similar situation. We had about 3,000, but most of them had a kind of block of mock setup code like this. Yeah, wow, them. okay. Um, and I found a few issues which have kind of scared me away from using them. Um, so you look at that cell method down there, yep. right? So I know, I can see that we're trying to sell Graham a chalk top, but I can tell from these mock objects exactly what methods you expect to be called when you're inside that sell method, right? Yep. So what I found is that that's kind of really coupling this test to the actual implementation of the code that you're writing behind it. Okay. Does, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I can see that your cell code is expecting all these particular things. Yeah, like find by name and, and calculate. Yeah, yep. right, right. So what happened to me was across my 3,000 tests, one very common method that most of my tests ended up in, I changed implementation, and boom, I broke about 1,000 tests in one oh, go. Man. 1,000 tests. Yeah, now that you mention it, when, when, sometimes I do break like, lots of tests all at the same time. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, and okay. Worse still, because that code was duplicated everywhere, I had to go through all of the methods to actually change them and add the new mock call in there. So it's a bit of a nightmare. It took us a few days to actually yeah, do this wow. across okay. the team. Yeah, it was. Uh, I found that you know that that brittle kind of coupling between the actual test, what we're trying to test, and the implementation was really, really hard work. And worse still, it actually made us quite reluctant to try refactorings going forward. Okay. Because we just knew that every time we changed the internals of our domain, we'd have this huge knock-on effect on our test case. It kind of became unmaintainable. So we had this kind of light bulb moment. Um, I saw it for watching a talk a few years ago. And I sort of switched from having my unit tests testing the implementation of the code to being much more behavioral focused. 
So the thing here is that I don't really want my unit test to care about how the internals of my methods are implemented. Okay. I want to try and test the behaviors without coupling myself in that way. Interesting. So yeah. what, what would that look like? Yeah, should we, should we do some virtual kind of coding on the fly here? Let's do some pair programming. Let's, let's kind of imagine a keyboard here. Yeah. Let's get going awesome. for it. Okay, cool. So All right. let's have a look what a class. Now you, you've got to kind of, you know, you could be a little bit surprised when you see some of this stuff. So right. let's, you know, let's just kind of go through it bit by bit. Awesome. And we'll see how we end up. Okay. So we're going to keep the test arranged in the same way, right? So we're going to have the triple A syntax still. Cool. Yep. We're going to keep it cool very, that. very similar because that's, that's really good. So let's set up some data. Okay, so interesting. Yeah, so in the original uh, test class, we were relying on mock objects really heavily at this point of our a range uh, test. Whereas what we're going to do here is actually create real objects behind the scenes. So these are our so domain no mocks. classes. Yeah, we're not using mocks. Okay. So you can imagine, for example, when we're hitting save on one of these. Oh, we'll talk about object mother and things like that later. But um, this is kind of using pre-canned sort of objects that are correctly set up. They've got state attached to them, etc. And we can twiddle them a little bit. You can see Graham has got a balance yep. of 10 down there. But we're going to save them. And that could be in a real database. It could be in like an in-memory database or something like that. Okay. But the point is we're trying to make this test kind of not so concerned about what's going on behind the scenes. So mm -hmm. we just want to set up the state of the system. Okay, cool. So let's go for the act bit then. Oh, what's, okay. what's this resolve here? Resolve, yeah, right. So I mean, you've probably come across resolve when you're dealing with things like IOC containers, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Autofac, that's what I use. Oh, yeah, Autofac's cool, right? So I remember in the uh, last test, we actually newed up the service at this point in time, and we passed it in the mock objects, right? Well, that kind of coupled us to the actual constructor of that object as well. So there's all these little couplings going on. That's a good point, because actually, whenever I add a new item to the constructor, it uh -huh. actually breaks all my tests. I have to go and, yeah, go and right. change e them. Yeah, right. Exactly that. Exactly that. Okay. So in this way, we're going to kind of get a few things uh, for free here. We're going to use resolve, which means we're using a real IOC container. That's being wired up with the real services as well. And it's using the real IOC configuration. So we're testing a bit more production code in doing okay. this. But it means that if we start adding these extra parameters to the ice cream van, it's not really going to concern us that much, because we don't need to worry about that here. We're just exhibiting this behavior, which is selling a chop top to Graham. OK. What, what does the um, uh, assert section look like? Yeah, let's have a look, shall we? So this is really straightforward. So again, mm. if you remember in your code that you showed me earlier, you were again sort of using mocks uh, for all parts of this. So you were making sure that certain methods have been called on collections and things like that. Yeah. I'm just looking at a collection here and I'm saying, hey, look, Graham's ice creams, do they have a chop top inside them? Okay. And the balance, it's just a number. Let's just check that it's the right number after we've done the behavior. Now, yeah, if I okay. was to go and refactor that cell method, you'd see that I wouldn't actually be changing any of this test because the behavior of selling an ice cream doesn't change that often, right? Hmm. But I should be free at will to go and refactor it. And I think this kind of makes that a little bit easier going forward. This is really interesting. Um, like, you know, I love doing TDD, and, and, but what we were just testing there is, is multiple classes together. And, yeah. You know, we all know that when we're doing TDD, we're doing unit tests, and unit tests yep. are when you test a single method on a single class, right, and you mock everything ah. out. So I, we're sorry. not really doing TDD anymore. So, sorry, so let's, let's go back up a little bit. So you said that a unit test is testing like a single method on a, on a single class. Yeah, right, okay, yeah. that's, that's really interesting. Where did you hear that? Uh, every, everyone knows it, you know, like Kent Beck and, and all of that sort of stuff. <laughs> Kent, ah, right, okay, ah. Look, I mean, I have to admit, I used to do this as well. And I would mock out all of the collaborators because the unit was the unit and that was the method or the class, yep, right? that's right, yep. So then I watched a video by a guy called Ian Cooper a few years ago. He did a talk called TDD, Where Did It All Go Wrong? Really okay. recommend you go and watch it. It's a yep. great, great talk. And it taught me a lot about how I do my testing today. But more importantly, it made me go and pick up the book. I forgot to bring it with me. Like, I normally have it in my bag, but I Obviously, didn't bring yeah. it to Sydney yeah. this time. Um, but anyway, I've, I've gone through that book from front to back. And one thing's really interesting, because Ken always refers to a unit as a unit of behavior, not an actual method huh. on a class. Really? Yeah. And it's just one of those things that kind of people drop the behavior bit and just kind of decided that the unit was the smallest thing that you could possibly test. Interesting. But yeah, the book kind of always talks about a unit of behavior. So it's kind of one of those cases. Ian had a really good quote, actually, from the uh, video that he had. Um, Test case per class approach fails to capture the ethos for TDD. Adding a new class is not the trigger for writing tests. The trigger is implementing a requirement or a behavior. The little classes and things that drop out of that should probably come from your refactorings that you do later. Okay. So as, as again, it's a great talk, but it's OK to test you know, more than one thing together, I think. Yeah, okay. class together. So I guess we're talking about testing behavior. We're talking about testing mm. you know, multiple classes. So mm -hmm. 
is, are you saying that we should just write UI tests for everything then and, and just test ah. the whole system from there? Oh, right, okay, yeah, I, I hadn't kind of gone to that logical conclusion, but I guess as you start sort of going up the abstraction scale, you do hit UI tests eventually, don't you? Yeah. Um, look, I'm not saying we shouldn't write UI tests, but I guess I should say we have to be a bit careful where we decide to use UI tests. Okay. Can, can I give you a couple more stories? Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'd love to Because I've, I've kind of been bitten by UI tests a little bit in the past. So actually the same project that I was working on. Luckily, there's no one in here working on that project. I did this talk in Perth, and people were kind of glaring at me. <laughs> um, so we had a project that had about 300 UI tests, right? Okay. And they all took about 20 seconds to run. So they're quite slow. It's quite slow a, a few hours, start. isn't it? Yeah, so the first thing that we noticed is that as we wanted to go faster and deploy faster, we were relying on these tests for a lot of our re uh, confidence in regression. So that meant that we had to wait and we had to have a green run to go into production with mm. them. And they were taking about three and a half hours to run by the time I left. So that became like a real barrier to actually deploying quickly. So that was the first problem that I found with them. They're notoriously brittle. I mean, you've probably seen this, right? Have you written UI tests before? Yeah, they, they are a bit of a pain in the ass, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, you change your UI slightly. If you don't have your test laid out properly, then that could cause it to break really easily. Mm. Um, then you get the kind of intermittent failures as well. Let's say you didn't quite put the thread.sleep right, or you haven't waited for a piece of your UI to update. That's one of those where you've got to try and get onto that and fix it. Because if you don't fix these UI tests quickly, then they tend to sort of start dying as a whole. And before you know it, you've got a suite of 300 tests and half are just read permanently, but you still go live because you lose all your confidence in them. Yeah, okay. Keeping on them like that though is really hard work because they take a lot of time to look after them and maintain them. So we had a rule as a team that we were not allowed to start working in the morning until we'd investigated any of our failing UI tests. Okay. So it took us a long time, but we started to get a little bit better and a bit more confident in them. I had one really funny one. Can I, can I give you like a hilarious story? Yeah, yeah I'd hilarious. Love to hear it wasn't that. hilarious at the time. We were kind of tearing, <laughs> tearing our hair out. Uh, we had a UI test and it failed over a period of about six months. Man, we oh, wow. could okay. not work out what was going on with this test. And we had a test, a UI test that was driving an analysis query behind the scenes. Okay. So what we found out in the end was that the UI was being exercised really quickly because it was automated. So it's click, 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 click. Audit events were getting raised. And every so often, an uh, audit query wouldn't work. Like the aggregate data that came out was just wrong. The test failed. Mm -hmm. And it took us a while before we realized what was going on. And under occasional circumstances, maybe if you're lucky once every three or four days, the test would run at a certain time. And the virtual machine that was actually writing out the audit events would resynchronize its clock. Oh, no. And when it resynchronized its clock, <laughs> it went back about 0 0.2 of a second in time. And because we were flowing events through it so quickly, Back 0.2 seconds, put one event that should have always followed the original event behind the original event, which actually broke the analysis query. Wow. Through virtual machine clock syncs. That must have been really hard to do. It was diagnose. horrible. Yeah. It, 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 I will never get that time back in my life, right? <laughs> it's gone, dusted. I'm, I'm 43 now, so, you know, how I wish I could have that time back. But man, that sounds so, really painful. So, like, yeah, so, you know, UI tests. Whoa. So, so what I'm getting from that is like UI tests are really painful. We should just not write UI tests at all, right? Never. Oh, I, well, I wouldn't say that. No, I think that we have to think a little bit more pragmatically about when we use UI tests. Cool. Hello, my name is Rob Moore. And I'm Graham Foster. And today we're going to be talking to you about advanced testing techniques. Um, the conversation that you just witnessed between us is one that we've both had, uh, or a similar conversation, many times with many people from many companies over many years. Oh, yes. Um, and it provides a lot of great context for what we're going to be discussing today. Now, the things that we're going to be talking about today are essentially an amalgamation of, of thinking and, and mindset and practices and techniques that we've developed over the last few years that we've found to be highly effective in software testing that we do. <laughs> So let's do a quick recap of that first 15 minutes. Um, I think, and I would argue, it's more important and useful to test the behavior of our classes over the actual implementation detail. It's easier to write the tests, I find, and it's less brittle and easier to refactor going forwards. I think it's important that we get across that a unit at a unit test is not necessarily a method or a class. A unit is a unit of behavior, and that can involve multiple classes collaborating with each other. Going on from that, a lot of people will talk about integration tests. And a lot of people will say that an integration test is about testing multiple classes together. 
I would disagree with that. Personally, I think an integration test is where we have disparate systems, and we want to make sure that all those systems can communicate with each other. So I'm OK to call an integration test that, but for me, all unit tests can be working with multiple classes. Um, and UI testing is useful, but I think it's very, very fragile, and we should use it judiciously. Absolutely. So I guess the question is, how do we test behavior? Um, we got a little bit of a, a, an inkling as to how we might do it through the pair programming exercise that we did <laughs> before. Pair programming. Um, and there's a few things to talk about here, because if you think about a range act assert, um, in a test where we're testing behavior, the code that we're testing in act is a lot more complex than it might be for a more traditional implementation focused unit test. So um, you know, there's a lot more complexity there. And by association, often the data that we have to set up in the arrange section is going to be more complex. And then the things that we're actually asserting on at the end are also more complex. Now, what this means is that we have to use techniques to deal with that complexity. Because um, if we don't, and we've used the approaches that we've always used, we're going to be in for a world of pain. It's mm -hmm. not going to be a very pleasant experience. Now, for us, the way that this um, uh, manifests, I guess, is a mindset of treating test code like production code. We should be refactoring our test code. We should be using patterns in our test code. So um, over the next few minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll cover some of the patterns and the techniques that we use and that mm -hmm. we find highly effective for testing behavior. First one of these is something called subcutaneous tests. Um, now, subcutaneous is a medical term. It means under the skin. And a subcutaneous test is probably best um, explained through a diagram like this. The basic idea is we're trying to skip that UI layer that, as we've already discussed, uh, is typically very slow and very fragile to test, and then go in just below that. So it might be like an MVC controller or an MVVM view, or if you're using something like CQRS, it might be a command or, or a query or something like that. And then we have our full production code underneath, typically powered by our production IOC container. Um, and any databases or data sources that are owned and, and sort of completely um, isolated or within our, our system, we actually hook them up as well because they're not external to our system. They're part of our system. They're part of our unit of behavior. The one thing we do do, though, is that we isolate any external systems and we mock them out because we're not trying to do an end-to-end -end test or an integration test. Those are still useful, but by doing that, we would be adding some of that slowness and fragility that we're trying to avoid in this style of testing. And we found that subcutaneous testing is a highly effective way of writing unit tests against a system that are reasonably fast but allow us to test behavior rather than implementation detail. Awesome. So I want to uh, think a little bit about when we're writing a test, how do we decide which type of test to write? Because we have these subcutaneous tests, and we do still have sort of lower level unit tests, which, which may have some value in certain uh, situations. Now, going back to Ian Cooper's talk, he has this really great analogy. He refers to it as shifting gears. So who, who's got a manual car in here? Not many, right? I was in Europe the other week. To. And manual cars <laughs> were everywhere over there. They were there. fun, yeah. But you know, think of your car, it's got a gear stick, right? So when we're writing a subcutaneous test where we're really just testing the behavior, we've picked up a feature, it's pretty clear how we're going to develop it. There's nothing new in there. We're in sixth gear, fifth gear, I don't know, top gear, whatever your car is. Um, but we're going, we're speeding down the highway. We can just write a sub test. It's pretty easy. We can use the object mothers and the test data builders to create our setup data and just do nice assertions at the end. So all good, move along. Sometimes, though, we come across something that's a little bit trickier. So maybe like you're working in a trading environment or something like that, and you've got to implement some complex financial algorithms down there. You might find that a behavioral test at that high level is kind of almost too high up to start working out how to implement that algorithm. So this is Ian's analogy of shifting gears, going down the stack. So it's almost like as we start dropping down the gears, we're starting to isolate more and more of it, what it is we're trying to test by mocking out more and more collaborators to the very lowest level where we're literally back at the mock objects with just testing a little bit of behavior, subbing out all of the collaborators. Now, once you've got this test, there's a couple of important things I think that you want to bear in mind. The first is that you still want that behavioral test, which is covering this code path, because that's still a very important test. It's, it's kind of easy to reason with, it's easy to read, uh, to read and it's going to be easier to maintain. So you've got the code paths covered. So you have to decide whether you want to actually keep these low-level tests or delete them. So I'll say it's OK in some situations to go and delete tests. Like, that's, Great. that's OK. That's right? shocking. We, can, we can do that. <laughs> we can do that. But there's a few things you might want to think about before you decide whether or not to delete it. The first is that, uh, let's say you get new people coming onto your team. 
those low-level tests could actually be really useful to work out how something was implemented or why it was implemented in that way. So they could be used as kind of a learning exercise. So that's one possible reason you might want to keep them. But again, they're going to be brittle. They're going to inhibit you from refactoring that code later on. And because they're covered by a behavior test, you can make that decision within your team whether or not to keep it or to delete them. Whether the other it's reason, stay or go, it's like a clash song. Should the other reason why you might want to, um, sorry, the other reason why you, <laughs> why you might want to um, not delete them is if you needed that low level of test to actually design that really complex code in the first place, um, then when you're maintaining the code, you might still need them to sort of understand it when you dig in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Nice. OK, so who here does red-green refactor? A couple of hands going up. Yeah, who does red-green? <laughs> red-green factor. Who does red, I got like red-green tractor? It's kind of a bit like that. So when I'm doing red-green refactor, I guess traditionally what I would do is I would write a failing test. And I was quite good at writing my failing test, right? As Kent Beck said, write a red test. And then he said, make the test go green. Now, I guess the bit that I kind of muddled up a little bit was when I made the test go green, I kind of made the test go green with really beautiful code. It was the code that I always dreamed of. It had all the power. I had my golf book next to me. <laughs> I got design patterns <laughs> next to me. I am going to make that test green, but it's going to be beautiful by the time I've uh, finished that bit of code. Now, I've called this liberated red-green refactor. And again, it's going back to the TDD where did it all go wrong video. Um, because Ian Cooper makes a call out in that where he says that Actually, red-green refactor is really three separate steps for a reason. So our brain struggles to work in two different modes at the same time. And if we try and make beautiful code when we try and make that test go green, we're kind of almost pitching it against itself because one half is just interested in solving the problem, whereas the other half is trying to make it pretty and elegant. So I challenge you the next time you're writing a, the green portion of your test to use the most horrible Dirty, disgusting code. Stop procedures. Possibly. <laughs> Let's not go that far. <laughs> but don't think about design patterns. Literally, write a transaction script. It's OK, because your brain is going to work better just trying to make that test go green. Now, this has got some really nice benefits, because we're not going to forget the refactor stage and just leave the code like that, right? Because that would be a really, really awful thing to do for the rest of our teammates. Instead, we're going to use that refactor stage to actually move to all of the nice, elegant design patterns that we want inside our code base. A couple of interesting things, though. When we're doing refactorings at this stage, we're not adding new behavior. The behavior is already covered by the test. So there is no reason to test the refactored code in any different way. We don't need new tests for it. And that refactored code quite often um, shows up as internals or privates inside the modules because we don't need to expose it to the outside world. It's already tested by the behavior test. And that's the important part of it. So next time you're going from green, uh, red to green, think awful code, and then refactor after that. It's a really, really nice uh, mindset to be in, I find. Nice. So we talked about how there's a lot more complexity when we're testing behavior in each of the three sort of stages of your test. And we start with the arrange section. We need to create more complex data structures. There's two fairly well-known patterns, Object Mother and Test Data Builder, that exist in the ecosystem, and um, they are highly effective. We've had a lot of um, success, I guess, in combining them together. Um, and rather going, than going into that in detail, I mean, you saw a little code snippet when we did the pair programming. But um, that link there goes to a talk that I did at ANZ Coders a couple of years back that where I go in detail about the pros and cons of each of those two patterns and also the pros and cons of combining them and um, a little bit of a deep dive into some of the code to actually implement that. Um, so I'll leave that with you. But then if we look at the act section, uh, as we said, there's, there's more complex code that we're actually testing. And one of the things that we do with a subcutaneous test is we actually mock out uh, the external systems. Now, there's a beautiful pattern called VCR pattern that really helps us with this. So if, if, if we were, say we were talking to 10 different external systems over a number of different tests, um, if we were to try to hand roll all of the sort of, let's say it's a HTTP API, we're going to hand roll all the JSON responses that get returned, it'd be really tedious to set that up. But the beautiful thing about the VCR pattern is we can insert that as a cross-cutting concern, flip a switch, and then all of the calls actually get made to the real systems, returning the real responses, except they get stashed away in the file system and committed into source control. And then we flip the switch back, 
And what happens is from then on, those sort of stashed mock, uh, so those stashed responses get returned in a sort of mocked fashion. Um, so this is very quick to set up. Um, but then the great thing is, if any of our API contracts change with any of our dependencies, we can flip the switch again, rerun all the tests. They might take a little bit longer and they might be a little bit more brittle for that test run, but you know, you just do it a couple of times, you'll get the new responses on your file system, you can commit those new responses, flip the switch again, and then they've all been updated. Very quick, very easy. So it's a really nice pattern to, um, you know, to, to quickly set up those external dependency mocks. Can I ask you a quick question on that? Yes. Do you need the Betamax video <laughs> No. <laughs> I think the one at the front's Betamax. Interestingly, sure. from memory, one of them, uh, the, it's been ported to many languages. The original implementation <laughs> was in Ruby. I think one of the ports was called Betamax. I could be wrong. Oh, right. But it might, uh, yeah, just something in the back of my head tells Trivia. me that one of them was Betamax. Nice. And then if we look at the assert section, there's an incredibly powerful technique that we use quite a lot called approval tests. Um, the JavaScript ecosystems decided to call them snapshot tests for various reasons. Um, and the way that this works is we're essentially using the human brain as an assertion mechanism. Now that sounds very fancy. Wow, did you, did you say the human brain is an assertion mechanism? I did. Do you like plug in sort of <laughs> you plug into the computer. You're running the tests. Thankfully, no, we no? don't need okay, to do that. Cool. No humans were harmed in the making okay, of this talk. Good, good. And um, the basic way that this works is you will give uh, some sort of complex structure. So it might be uh, a bunch of JSON or XML that you pass to an endpoint, or it might be a HTML email you're sending to a customer, or um, you know it could be a complex object structure that you've turned into JSON and then you want to check that it's the same as, as you expect it to be. And the basic way that it works is that when um, there's a, a change to it, you have a diff window pop up on your machine, you can manually inspect what it looks like and approve it, and then that gets stashed into the file system and committed to source control and will run on your computer or the dev uh, machines and also the CI server. And if there's a difference between what's generated and what was stashed on the file system, then the test fails. Now, it's kind of hard to describe that in words and, and it might be a bit fuzzy for some of you. So let's have a look at an actual example. Uh, so this is some code that's quite similar to some code that I wrote uh, a few years back in a telecommunications context. So uh, essentially we're setting up a, a, you know, a shopping cart of some sort. We've got NVN, VoIP, and an international calls bonus option. Um, we've got the arrange act assert, in this case given when then, but it's the same thing. And it's a subcutaneous test against you know, some sort of MVC controller or checkout controller. Um, so we're gonna execute the index action, which is posting to the checkout. Um, and then this here is where we're doing our assertion. We grab out the mock provisioning system from our, CI, uh, from our IOC container. Um, we pull out the request that should be in there from that uh, checkout having been posted. And then we've got this magic line at the end, should match approved. And that's all we need. That's kind of crazy, but let, let's let's look at an example. That is cool, so yeah, I'm used to writing so many assert statements at that point in time, checking for different properties and things. Absolutely right. Um, so in this example, let's say I've done some some coding. Um, maybe I was a bit tired. I didn't do a very good job of it, and so this is what I get. Now we can see here this is the the JSON payload that's sent to the provisioning system that sets up the MVM and, and the VoIP and the phone line, all those sorts of things. And we can see here our international calls bonus option has actually disappeared. So I've done something very wrong there. Yeah, it's not um, and we can good. see here that the work phone is now actually the same as the home phone rather than what it should have been. So I've obviously made a couple of mistakes here in this instance. But the great thing about this is I can look at it and the context is there. I can immediately see what I've done wrong. I messed up the where clause on the link expression and when I rewrote that mapping code, I clearly used the wrong dot on the IntelliSense for the work phone there. So I can instantly know where I need to go and fix that code. It's very quick. You just said that um, normally, you know, in, yep. the, in the past, you'd have lots and lots of asserts for something like this. Maybe you'd have one per, per property. So you'd have yeah. a good 50, you know, 20, 50 yep. asserts, something like that. Um, in that instance, if one of them goes wrong, I'm looking at a line number and I'm like looking down and it's like, you know, the, the work phone, you know, and, 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 mm. and, and I can't immediately see what's wrong there. It's going to take me a lot longer to actually diagnose what's wrong. Yeah. Or if you've got one assert per method, if you're kind of in that sort of enterprise where they have rules like <laughs> that, that's going to be a really yep. big class, isn't it? Yeah. This has actually saved my bacon in other ways as well. Like I've had a situation where one of these complex um, data objects, we've added another object to it. And then somebody forgot to go and put some asserts on that object, forgot its existence. Yeah. And then you're not actually, the test is still passing even though you're breaking those properties. Whereas this kind of 
is future proof in that when you they add new objects, up. they just pop up instantly. So it's obvious that something's changed on that structure. So yeah. it's uh, really, really powerful. It works for images as well, right? Ah, uh, yeah, good point. Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, so yeah, incredibly powerful technique. Highly recommend you use it. <clears throat> now, let's take a step back. <laughs> We've been talking about testing behavior, but in, in reality, we're actually talking about something a little bit different, a little bit broader, and something that we call pragmatic testing. And the basic idea behind it is, when you're writing a test, or deciding that you want to write a test, or what kind of test you want to write, you should actually, rather than going, well, this is the way we've always done it, like a little sheep, uh, or you know, I'm going to write this test because I'm writing a test, or whatever it might be, we actually stop and think about the test that we're writing and the context within we're writing it and make a decision about, does this test deliver me value? Is it giving me confidence or some other thing that is actually valuable to me and my team? Now, um, there's a really great talk by Jimmy Bogard um, in, I think it was the same NDC Oslo conference that the um, Ian Cooper talk was in. I think it was oh, right, okay. Oslo 2013 or 12, cool. one of the two. Um, and he had a really great quote that sums this up for me really well. The ultimate goal here is to ship code. It's not to write tests. Tests are just a means to the end of shipping code. We can have 100% code coverage and no one use our product, or we can have 0% code coverage and we can be a millionaire. <laughs> um, you know, it, th there's no correlation between the two. OK, so pragmatic testing kind of says that we don't always have to write all the tests that we've been writing previously. So what does that mean in terms of when do we and how do we decide whether to write our tests or not? Um, I saw a talk at Test West a few years ago by a lady called Sam Connolly, who I believe was working at Tyro at the time. And she had a great talk on deciding whether or not to write a UI test, and a very simple system for helping you to make that decision. Um, so you can see it here. It's really straightforward. She had a simple graph. On the y-axis, it said, what is going to be the impact to our business if this feature we are delivering breaks? And then on the x-axis, she said, how often is this feature going to get used? So it's pretty easy for most features to put them somewhere on that graph. But the really, really clever part, and it's such a simple thing, I wish I had thought of this, hmm. is she drew a couple of diagonal lines down here. And she said, basically, if you're really far to the left, i.e. number four, contact us, not much is going to happen to your business if the contact us link is broken on your website. People can find it on Google or somewhere else. And it's probably not going to happen that often because people don't click on contact us as much as they're going to exercise other features in your application. So don't write a UI test for it. It's OK. It's a test that's just going to possibly be slow, hold you back, be brittle. You're going to spend time fixing it. Don't write it. It's not worth it. Now, as you start to move up this graph towards the right-hand side and you pass this threshold here, then options, uh, features two and six, transfer funds and login. Well, look, if you're a bank and transfer funds is broken, that's <laughs> a huge impact to your business, right? And that's going to get used a lot as well. Yeah. So you probably want to make sure that you've got some decent UI tests around that, because they're going to give you more confidence. So it's a really, really simple uh, idea for deciding when to write a UI test or not. Yep. So another thing that we often think about in terms of how to decide what kind of tests we want to write is a concept that we call speed versus confidence. Now, in this context, when we say speed, we mean you've got some sort of test suite. How long does it take from starting to run that test suite to when that test suite finishes? Uh, and then confidence. Once you've finished running that test suite, how confident are you that there is a bug in your code? Or put another way, how confident are you to let your product owner click the button to deploy to production? <laughs> now, if we do some very scientific <laughs> graphing of this, <laughs> and we start with manual testing and automated UI testing, these exercise the system on behalf of a user. So they give us a lot of confidence, but they're pretty slow. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, in comparison, if we look at an implementation-focused test, like the one we had towards the very beginning of the talk, it's in process, in memory, takes a few milliseconds to run. It's really, really fast. But the amount of confidence it gives us is really low, relatively speaking, because we're only testing a little portion of the code, and we're often mocking out production implementation details. Now, if we take one of those implementation tests, we add on some uh, real database calls. We've got some out of process communication now, so we're an order of magnitude slower. But there's a whole class of errors that we would now pick up. You know, is the ORM mappings correct? Have our database migrations put the schema into a state that actually works with our system? You know, when we hydrate the objects back, does that work, etc. Now, if we start graphing this, we sort of start seeing that there's an inversely proportional relationship between speed and confidence. Now, why is this useful for deciding how we test? 
pretty much every company these days is you know, trying to be DevOps and, and all of that sort of thing. <laughs> what we're trying to do is create faster feedback loops. We're trying to get features out to our users faster and faster. So if we can come up with a testing strategy that increases our speed whilst giving us enough confidence, then obviously that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Let's explore this a little bit further. We have a hypothesis. That hypothesis is that you're not going to deploy to production unless you meet some minimum level of confidence. 100%. Yep, and often product owners, <laughs> when you ask them what's the minimum level of confidence, they're going to say 100%. <laughs> However, we challenge you <laughs> to set a minimum confidence level that's actually as low as possible. Now, you might get laughed out of the room for that, but based on the last slide, what happens if we set a minimum confidence level that's as low as possible is we have a much faster feedback loop, which means if there is a problem, and let's be honest, 100% is obviously not possible, there is always bug in, bugs in our code, then that means that it's even faster for us to get fixes out for those bugs. Now, what we would then say is that you would create a testing strategy that meets this confidence level as fast as possible so that we can realize this sort of fast feedback loop dream. <laughs> But then there's a really, really important point that's often missed in, and from what we've seen in testing strategies in most companies, which is you shouldn't just set a testing strategy and say, job done, off to the mm -hmm. pub, and never look at it again. We need to have that continuous improvement mindset that's so core to Agile and DevOps. And we need to actually change our testing strategy over time. But we don't just change it willy-nilly. We need to change it based on hypotheses, on data. We need to go and measure things like, what's the cycle time from an idea to that idea getting in production? Or how many bugs do we get in production when we release our software? And adjust our testing strategy over time to make sure that we improve them. I think metrics like the state of DevOps metrics can be really useful here. As yes, kind of spot on. for you know, industry standard metrics that you not only can use to measure yourself, but you can actually compare yourself against other organizations as well. So I think that was the, uh, you've got the um, lead time to change. So like how long from code commit to getting something in the hands of the yep. customer. You've got MTCR. the change failure rate. Yeah, how long does it take you to recover from that? And how often are you deploying? So there's thousands of uh, data points for that where you can start to sort of see and measure yourself. And um, this has all been like statistically proven to match against the business's uh, revenue stream, et cetera. So they're great for very simple metrics to derive and really powerful. Yeah, these definitely. Kind of conversations. Yeah, really good stuff. Now, when we kind of look at this, we actually had a bit of a realization and it's a bit shocking to some people, but mm. that first sort of step there, that's, that's not a technical decision. It's not testers that should be deciding that. That's a business decision. The amount of confidence for each feature, that's, that's something a business person, a product owner should be deciding. Now, sure, once they've made that decision, then obviously the testing strategy we come up with to meet that confidence level is a technical decision that hopefully not just testers, but testers and developers working together closely are making. And then it's everyone's responsibility to continuously improve. It should be a mindset that's throughout the entire team. But there's one question that I'm assuming is in some of your minds right now, which is, that sounds great. Isn't that wonderful mm -hmm. theory that technical people and the business people are going to talk together and make a decision? <laughs> and you know we're not going to get told off for writing tests rather than getting features out as fast as we can. Yeah, who's had that conversation in here where you kind of go to a business person and say, oh, we, we want to write some UI tests for this. Ah, sorry, we've got to ship this. Yeah, and you get shut down. <laughs> Can't do it. <laughs> yeah. We need more features. <laughs> um, but we do have an answer to this. And it's something called risk-based testing. Now, let's look at what risk-based testing is. Essentially creating a risk-based model that gives us a common nomenclature to have discussions between technical people and business people about the risk on a per-feature basis. Once you've had this discussion and you, you come up with a risk rating for a particular feature, then it makes sense to track it in your task tracking system. And the problem here, though, I guess, that we need to solve is to have that conversation and for it to be a meaningful conversation that is easy to have um, to bridge the gap between you know, the business people and the technical people, we need a clear way to determine a rating. So this is where we can start to uh, bring things which are already quite often used in businesses to start bridging that gap, that sort of uh, language gap between the business and the engineering department. So what you're looking at here is a, uh, a risk model. So. A lot of you might work for companies that already have these in place. I work for a bank over in uh, Western Australia, and uh, pretty much we breathe by our risk models. They're so important to the function of the bank, so, which is a great thing because it means that everybody understands these things. Now, they're quite often they're going to be laid out in the terminology of your business, 
Um, the one you're seeing here is, is not ours. It's one that Rob and I uh, grabbed from the internet the other day. Uh, but let's have a quick look at it. So we've got a couple of axes. On the y-axis, very straightforward. We've got a likelihood. So this is basically how likely is this thing to happen? Is, uh, is it going to happen? So look, at the top, almost certain. It's going to often occur, occur once a week. Down the bottom, it's rare, conceivable, but only on extreme circumstances, once in 100 years. So again, it should be fairly straightforward with the business to start working on a risk rating for each of your features, because they already understand this language. Looking along the top, we've got the consequences of if this was to happen. So you can see this one is kind of talking about injuries and financial loss. So it's possibly from a kind of hospital uh, realm or something like that, because on the far right hand side, we've got catastrophic risks could cause death or massive financial loss. So this is pretty serious stuff on this rating. But the key here is that for every feature you're going to start building, you want to have a conversation up front, which is going to involve product owners, stakeholders, testers, developers, analysts, all the people basically that are involved in delivering this feature to put it somewhere inside this matrix. So let's say that we've got a feature where it's possible that there could be a moderate financial loss. So it's going to fall inside the moderate category. So that hopefully is something if we can agree with the business, we can put that into our tracking system. That's now a given. So how are we going to use this to decide how to test this item? So this is where we can drop into a really simple model uh, for risk-based testing. So Rob and I threw this one together. It took us like five minutes. It's a starting point. You might already have one, but if not, you know, start with something simple like this, and then you can always inspect it and adapt it as you're going forward. So if we take our medium base risk, it falls into the middle column here. So what this is telling us, and this will all be agreed up front as part of your testing methodology and strategies, is that you're going to do a manual test of this feature once it has been built. So that's a bit of like exploratory testing. Just kind of have a once over on it, make sure that it feels like it's hanging together. We're going to have basic coverage on the unit tests. So we might have some subcutaneous tests, kind of behavior level. We're not worried about kind of using more advanced testing techniques like fuzz testing or property testing or things like that, because it's a fairly straightforward feature. Um, and we're not going to have a UI test for it, because it doesn't warrant it based off its risk rating. Now, you can see for something which is a critical risk, we actually have a lot more uh, testing going on for this. So we're going to manually test it every single release. We're going to have unit tests which implement all sorts of testing over this feature, because it's incredibly important this feature does not fail. And for our UI tests, we're not just going to have a happy UI test, but we're going to test all the negative runs through that feature as well. So that's going to be, obviously, a lot more work in delivering this mm -hmm. feature. And if we have this formalized up front, we can take that into our estimation sessions, and we can estimate the complexity of delivering this item accordingly based off the amount of testing that we have to do. So these are really powerful models. It is, but and the beautiful thing is, when you start thinking about this, you realize this isn't actually just about testing. If you're working on a feature that's like a critical feature, you're going to spend more time analyzing to understand mm -hmm. the thing in great detail. You're going to spend more time implementing and doing defensive coding practices and various other things. And you're going to spend more time testing it. Um, what this means is that when you have this conversation with your business stakeholder, and they decide this feature is critical. They know that that feature is not going to take two days to implement. Mm -hmm. They know it's going to take four weeks to implement. And so they can have a very, we can have a very pragmatic mm -hmm. business conversation about how much they want to invest in a particular feature. Yeah. And you don't have these silly situations where teams are writing you know, life or death software and being given a lot of pressure um, to kind of cut corners on features that they really shouldn't cut corners on. But on the same token, they have a clear pass to, for something that doesn't really matter to not really put any real effort in. Awesome. It's pretty cool. That's great. The, the one other thing I'd say is that um, what you would do, like so a lot of big companies will already have one of these, but if you don't, what you need to do is make sure that these are in terms that are relevant to your company and your business. And you can be quite specific. Some of the ones that I've seen have specific financial amounts for these, like you know, greater than $2 million of, of, of financial loss or you know, whatever it might be. So, we've built our amazing feature, we've nurtured it, we've started from nothing, we put it into production, done. Yeah, move along, happy days, throw it over the fence. Go to the pub. Go to the pub. <laughs> it's good, right? Unfortunately not, because really, I guess once we've put a feature into production, it's kind of like the end of the beginning for that feature. And now it's into the rest of its life. 
And there's a lot of things that we have to think about when it's in the real world, which I think all fall into kind of similar testing categories. So I want to go through some things that I've kind of come across in the last few years, which I think have really, again, changed the way that I think about features in production and DevOps and things like that. So I want to start with a concept called behavior-driven infrastructure. So can I get a show of hands in here for kind of who's done this or has been using it or has heard of it? <laughs> cool. So we've got a, got a few people. Th this, is, this is brilliant. I love this. Um, so I work for a bank, and we have got extremely complicated security architectures that we have to run within to make sure that our organization is compliant. So these things normally would be built by a team off to the side. They would go and set up all the networks for you. And you'll kind of have this implicit trust that it's just working OK. But when it comes to actually ensuring that that thing is compliant, that the network is still working, how are we going to do that? Now, BDI kind of turns the actual building of that infrastructure onto its head and says, well, what about if we could express our infrastructure in terms of BDD tests, just like we can express our application features? So I'll give you an example of that. Let's say that we have a couple of subnets, and they are only allowed to talk to each other over port 443. So you could conceive a BDI test that said, given zone Z20, when I attempt to connect to zone Z21 over port 80, then the connection will not be made. So let's say we started off with that. So there are DSLs in Ruby. I think it's um, RSpec or something, which um, is really great for expressing this kind of um, test. So if we're running against AWS or um, Azure, we can put some code up there that can actually check that real network connection for us. So that test will start off red, because there is no network. There's nothing there. So let's say we get our ARM template and we build a VNet. We put two subnets inside it. They can talk to each other over many, many ports. So that test is still going to be red, because that connection can get through. And then what we do in our ARM template is we're going to add some sort of network rule to say, nah, let's start blocking off the ports from this. When we do that, the test goes green. So we've used these tests to start to build up these complex kind of architectures and topologies um, on-premise, in the cloud, wherever you need to put your networks. So they're great for helping us build it, but they have an added benefit, which is that because these tests are actually running against the real networks, we can keep using them. So once that network is up and we're dropping our applications into it, we can continuously run the test against the network to ensure that the compliance hasn't been broken. So they give us a great way to kind of audit and make sure that our networks are as they should be. So very, very powerful. Um, so people are writing software nowadays, and it's, it's not an all or nothing replacement when we put something into production. So I remember back in the day, we'd kind of just do a whole cutover of everybody. And that's really risky as well. That's really, really dangerous. Um, we don't know how the service is going to scale in the real world. Is it going to have a negative impact on other services, et cetera, et cetera. So things like blue-green deployments and canary deployments can really help us here with testing our software in the real world. Because we can put something in a blue slot, and we can slowly move traffic onto it. And we can make sure that it's not having adverse effects on other services, which are in the same kind of uh, service uh, architecture up there. Testing in production is awesome. We're all building microservices nowadays. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to actually test these in an isolated environment, because there are so many of them. There are so many moving parts. So being able to test in production is going to be a great asset if we can get to that. If we can have test accounts, test customers, and we can continuously ensure that our critical business features are providing an adequate SLA when they are running in the real environment, that's, again, a really, really powerful thing to be able to do. So nothing tells you that things are working better than a test in production. Um, who's uh, heard Charity Majors talk? I was fortunate enough to see her in Perth um, a year or so ago. And she has this great phrase, which is observability um, over monitoring. Monitoring over observability. I've got that right. I've probably got that the wrong way yeah, around. Oh, good. Rob's, <laughs> Rob's nodding furiously at me. So when we're putting so many microservices into the real world now, um, in cloud environments, we have to expect that the environment is going to fail at some point in time. There's going to be something which has got a degraded service. It's just not working. Something's gone wrong up there. Now, if we're building microservices the way that people like Sam Newman describe them, then they should be autonomous components. Right? If your microservice is going to go down the moment another service goes down and just have this huge knock-on effect, then that's obviously not going to be a great architecture to be deploying. But if your microservice is autonomous, 
And let's say one of its services it depends on goes down, but it can still service a query in a different way. We've hit a really weird state now because we have a network where we have a bunch of services. Some are up, some are down, yet we're still providing a service back through to the customer. So it's really important to stop maybe thinking about our network as having to be entirely up or else things are bad and start looking in terms of what level of performance are we actually providing through to our users. So we are certain that we're always providing them a service. Um, and that could be with things being down or up. Um, and the last one I'll pick on here is just magic number testing. Mm -hmm. So this is a really interesting one. So has anyone ever integrated with a payment provider like Stripe? Right, cool. So they have these great kind of ideas where they will give you a set of uh, credit card numbers or customer IDs. And the different numbers will respond in different ways. So one of them might respond with overdrawn. One of them might respond with the account is locked. So magic number testing gives us a way to be able to, I guess, put up a service and then allow others to test against it by using well-known transaction numbers so they can test all the failure states that could come back from this other service without having to set up data in specific ways and jump through hoops like that. So again, really powerful techniques to uh, help us um, testing, and especially when we're in production environments too. Absolutely. Now, this is, this is actually quite a small list. The, um, <laughs> the, the actual things that you might need to do in terms of t t testing after you deploy to production is actually enormous. And there was a really good slide on Rob Crowley's talk yesterday on service meshes um, that I highly recommend you check out that had a really, really extensive list of things. But while we were coming up with this list here, we kind of observed a little bit of a pattern between them. We've got things like testing in production, observability over monitoring, um, and things like synthetic transactions. And all of them are designed to work well in that sort of microservices type architecture where our deployments are much more dynamic than they were traditionally. Traditionally, you deploy one thing, it's either up or down. Mm. It's pretty straightforward. Yep. But in this sort of new, new architectural panacea that we have now, um, everything's a lot more dynamic. And I guess the, the final thought that we wanted to leave everyone with is out of all the patterns that you're using now and the practices that you're using, which ones are going to need to evolve um, you know, as well as the ones that we've already talked about to help us in, in the future. Thank you. So we've got about eight to ten minutes cool. of question time. So, Jeff? Yeah, sure. Um, Sam Crowley's actually said that anyone here in Sydney, she will run the, the, that, uh, that talk from Copper Yow over lunch for, for free. Nice. There oh, you go. cool. OK. So awesome. Awesome. That was just the one with the UI testing patterns on it. So um, just great. to repeat that, so Sam Connolly is based in Sydney, and she's offered for any company to run that talk that we referenced uh, over a lunchtime brown bag. Very cool. So getting contact with Sam directly? Yeah. She's pretty responsive on Twitter. She's been tweeting the last few days, so it's probably the easiest way to find her. <laughs> any other questions? Not that that was a question, but that's all right. I'll let you off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even mm, though it's mm. memory fast mm. and it's very isolated, yep. it adds half a second per thread. Yes, so it's a good point. I was actually, in some of the rehearsals, I casually dropped in to Rob a question about how long those uh, tests take when they're spinning up the database. And, and you're right, they do definitely take longer to do. Um, my experience was that because I was testing um, classes in collaboration as opposed to testing individuals and mocking everything out, I actually had a lot less tests. Yep than if I was uh, testing at a very low sort of isolated unit level. But it was a trade-off. And there were certain operations where I looked to um, actually go for a more like ports and adapter style architecture and just try and isolate the database component from it. Um, and I guess if you had Rob's graph where you have that diagonal line, maybe that's one that kind of sits between the unit tests and the uh, subcutaneous test with the database is where you're still doing behavioral tests, but you're trying to isolate those slower components out. I think, I mean, my experience has been, I used to run on like eight threads in parallel and each would have its own local DB and uh, they'd be taking about like 0.1 or two of a second to, because yeah. um, I wasn't rebuilding the database every time. I was using libraries like Jimmy Bogard's Respawn to take the database back to a well-known state. And, and that always appeared to be a lot faster than building from scratch 
each time. But I think there's definitely a few tricks you can do to try and speed them up. But if you are, and I think they're great tests because exercising the database actually really does give you a lot of confidence. But if you're finding that it is taking too long, maybe you could start looking at replacements like in memory. EF Core's got the in memory provider, for example. So yeah, I mean, I'd say most, most small to medium sized applications, like yeah, even if you have like a, a thousand or two of those sorts of tests, it's still like a, only a couple of minutes mm -hmm. that it's running for. And that's, that's mostly what we've seen. If you've got something enormous, well, you know, either you want to start breaking it up or sure, maybe in that case, that is too slow for your feedback loop and you want to mock them out knowing the trade-off of a lower amount of confidence, but a faster sort of release. And that's kind of where our pragmatic testing thing comes into play, right? Because it's saying, don't just do subcutaneous tests, like including the database, because we said it, do what makes sense in your context per feature. <laughs> Any other questions? Great question. Yep. So there's a, um, I go all the way back, hang on. Uh, almost, almost. Uh. <laughs> ah, <laughs> there. So that link there, it's a blog post that I wrote a few years back. Um, it's actually a review of Jimmy Bogard's holistic testing thing, but I've got a lot of content in there talking about um, like subcutaneous tests and those sorts of things. Um, and so there's, there's some coverage in there around this, but essentially, um, what we've found is that, that there's certain patterns that make it a lot easier to um, understand where problems are. So we kind of saw a little bit of that actually in our pair programming here. Um, no, not here, sorry. Where was it? Oh, no, it was the... Which one's that one you're looking for? This one, hang on. Uh, 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 this one. Um, so things like this here where we're using, in our case we use BD to five, but like splitting things up into different methods using like a BDD syntax can be helpful because then you'll, you'll know like which one of those it was in and so you immediately know where to look. Um, obviously if it's here, um, then you know, it's, it's sort of somewhere in your, in your stack. But that's where typically you know, you, you'll see the exception, you'll see a line number, you click through and you kind of get to where the problem is and most of the time to be honest, I haven't found it to be too much of a problem. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, there's a slight trade-off there, right? Like it might be, mm. you know, there's a few more classes you're testing. It might be a little bit harder to quickly find it. But typically with things like this, I've found Sasha pretty decent. Other questions? No, nope. cool. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everybody.